find my, there we go. Yeah, today we have Dr. Eric Wilkinson. Um, he is uh, adju adjunct faculty from the House Ear Clinic and he currently is at the Idaho Ear Clinic in Boise, Idaho. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, have Eric with us today. Many of you probably know him. I've worked with Eric for, God, it seems like over 10 years. We first went to Ecuador <laughs> to Puembo a yeah. long time ago. 13 and, years ago, yeah. Yeah. So um, today he's going to talk on uh, auditory brainstem implants in adults and children. And uh, I'll leave it up to Eric at this point to uh, do the further introduction. And uh, I'm looking forward to his lecture as, as we all are. Thank you, Eric. Thanks a lot, Richard. And it's a pleasure to be with you. I hope that uh, hope this technically goes fine. It's always it's always interesting to see what's what's happening with the technological stuff. They seems like they update things. So hopefully this goes smoothly. Um, like Richard said, um, I worked in Los Angeles from 2008 to 2020, and uh, I still have a faculty position at House Institute. And I decided to move up to Idaho. Uh, to join a, a neurotologist here who opened a practice about three years ago and and um, it's very busy here we don't have a lot of there's not a lot of people that do what we do and uh, we have very good teams here a lot of good audiology we have a huge audiology team in the area and really good neurosurgeons and it's it's an exciting place to be um, also a lot of fun there's a lot of outdoor stuff so if any of you like outdoor activities uh, skiing, um, fishing, camping, anything outdoors. Uh, I'm happy to host you here in Idaho, so please come. Um, anyway, we're gonna to talk today a little bit about um, auditory brain some implants. And this is, a, this is a topic that goes back many years and has sort of seen a resurgence in the last several years uh, with some interest in expanded applications of the auditory brain stem implant. And so we're going to kind of go over a little bit of the history of it, not too much history, just to kind of give you guys a, a taste as to what this originated at. Many of you may be familiar with ABI, some of you may not be, so we'll kind of go over this a bit. So this is, uh, can you see this, did, it, did you see the slide advance? Yeah, Eric, okay. but, um, I think you need to, I don't know, maybe other people, can everybody see this well? Is it all full on the screen? Is it, yes. do you, you can see it? Okay, good. We're seeing the presenters. Okay, yeah, I don't know if I can change that uh, because it. when I did it, um, I think I'm gonna leave it that way because I tried to change it and I, it couldn't, it didn't, uh, it wasn't very happy with me. Okay, so I think if, I think if everybody will tolerate it, we'll, well, maybe that, maybe is that better? Maybe like that? How's that? Better? Okay. Let me see if I can. That, uh, okay. uh, I think I'm going to go back to what I did. Sorry. I, oh, is that good? Can you see that? We see, I just, we just see you, Eric. Okay. Then we better go back to the other way. Just a second. Now, if you just take that and play it, yeah, you should be fine. I thought, yeah, it, it wants to go. Oh, there we go. Okay, good. Can you we're see good. that? We're good. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Hallelujah. Okay. So we're going to go over a little bit of the background here and look at um, some of the history of the ABI. So many of you have seen this picture before. This is a diagram of how the ABI is placed. Instead of, it's sort of a figurative diagram, but basically the idea is that we're using a device very similar to a cochlear implant, but instead of being in, placed in the cochlea, it's placed in the lateral recess of the fourth ventricle on the cochlear nucleus complex. And this is for patients whose auditory nerve or cochlea are not suitable for stimulation. So we're going more medial into the auditory system. Um, so the, the classic um, application of this was for neurofibromatosis type two, which as you know, ha uh, patients will experience uh, bilateral acoustic neuromas, and they will often lose both of their auditory nerves because of the surgeries and treatment. Um, in 1979, the first ABI was done in Los Angeles by William House and William Hitzelberger, the neurosurgeon that Bill House worked with. And in 2000, it was approved by the FDA for NF2 in ages 12 and above. So that's still the indication 
that the FDA has for ABIs now. It has not changed at all since the year 2000. There have been other uses of the ABI, which we'll talk about, but this is the current FDA approval for the device. Um, there have been there has been a number of non-tumor applications of ABI, uh, Vittorio Coletti, uh, Levent Sonarlu, uh, uh, Robert Baer, uh, Cordula Matisse in Germany. All these uh, centers have uh, begun using in the early 2000s. Really, is when we start started seeing an interest in using ABIs for non-tumor patients. Uh, there were always a couple that were along the way, but this became more uh, more of interest to people for using it in adults with non-tumor indications such as severe ossification of the cochlea, otosclerosis, failed cochlear implant, uh, trauma, uh, things like that. And so there was an interest also in children in using the ABI for children with inner ear malformations such as cochlear nerve deficiency or cochlear aplasia. And so Vittorio Coletti was the first person to start that movement that way. And there were other people that sort of have taken up the reins as well uh, since that time. So this is what the ABI looks like. Um, it's still pretty much this way, although it's been, there is a newer ABI 541 from Cochlear and also Medel now has an ABI as well. Um, and these devices have gotten a little bit smaller, but as you can see, the, the electrode paddle is about eight millimeters by three millimeters and it has 21 electrode contacts instead of the 22 on a CI. So it's using the very similar receiver stimulator to a cochlear implant. It has a ground electrode and then the coil with the removable magnet, very similar to um, a cochlear implant. Uh, I'll show you in a minute, I'll show you a diagram of sort of the development of the paddle. So this, this three layer cochlear's three row electrode paddle was sort of an evolution of design. We already talked a little bit about this, so I won't, I'll just kind of skip that one. This is the, some of the original designs. They originally had a bipolar, kind of a two electrode model that then changed from more of a locator stimulator bipolar electrode to sort of a, a paddle with two, this is kind of like a Dacron mesh with two contacts on it. And then it got expanded to more. And as you can see, the kind of design over time became multiple electrode contacts um, on a paddle. And so this, this is now the model. People are now talking about how we can adapt it maybe for better use in the future, such as making it curved and things. We'll talk a little bit about that. But for now, this is the model. At House in Los Angeles, um, there's been over 300 ABIs done, um, mostly for neurofibromatosis type two. This is actually the first ABI patient uh, to receive. She just passed away a couple years ago, but she lived into her late 80s and she used her single channel ABI uh, her whole life. So she had a single channel, one of the original ABIs with just a single channel and she used it her whole life. And her whole family had neurofibromatosis type two. Um, her name was Marilyn Davidson and she was an amazing woman. She basically said, told Bill House, I'm happy to do this as long as it'll help other people. And she kind of, she, she committed herself to having this done when it would have, never had been done before. This is actually a patient of mine who I operated on a few years ago with NF2. This is kind of these, how these patients present. Um, sometimes they present with a family history, sometimes they don't. So in this patient, this was a 16 year old boy who had no family history of neuro, neuro, neurofibromatosis two, who had a history of one, one year history of hearing loss in one ear. And uh, he got an audiogram and then he got an MRI and his MRI showed this. So this unfortunately is the initial mutation. So he's the initiator of the mutation in the family. Nobody had it before that. And he has two large acoustic neuromas, uh, as you can see. And actually at the time, I think he had normal hearing in the right ear and hearing a sensor neural loss in the left ear. So the larger tumor side had normal hearing, I think, um, if I remember right. But basically in this situation, you have an extremely large tumor on the right side, large tumor on the left. This right-sided tumor has to come out. Uh, and when you do remove that tumor, uh, either through a translabyrinthine approach or other approaches, and you can see in this case, there's some enhancement in the cochlea. So this was done transotic to remove, also remove the cochlea and the tumor in the cochlea. Uh, this is what happens. You do a transotic approach like we normally do for any other acoustic neuroma in translab. And this is the post-op MRI showing the tumor resection. So this is the tumor removed, other tumors in place. And the ABI, this is the CT showing the ABI in place. So we place the ABI at the end of the tumor removal. And um, uh, we, uh, 
at the end of the surgery, we'll, and we'll show you a little video of how that's placed a little later on, but uh, it's op you open in the lateral recess, you follow the lower cranial nerves, the ninth cranial nerve down, and you find the flocculus of the cerebellum and the tinea corodia, where the, you'll see them coming out of the lateral recess, and you find the lateral recess and you place the implant. So a few years ago, um, you know, ABIs had been done for quite a long time, and I think there was a little bit of a falling out with ABIs. People kind of, you know, many centers had tried an, an ABI or two, didn't get really good results. Um, and so there was kind of, I think in the, in the late 2000s, uh, there was quite a bit of, you know, at least in America, there was a lot of feeling of maybe ABRs don't work that well. Maybe, you know, maybe we shouldn't be doing these things uh, because we've got other options. So this was from a talk I gave back in 2012. These are comments that I heard people say uh, about ABIs. For example, they don't work. Uh, most of our ABI patients didn't get any benefit when we tried to do this. Uh, people don't really use them. Uh, you've got a huge tumor. That's not going to give you really any chance to hear because the cochlear nucleus will be damaged. Uh, we have cochlear implants and people are using those with NF2. So why would we need ABIs? We can just put a cochlear implant in. Maybe we can treat the tumor with radiation. Maybe we can partially remove the tumor and put a cochlear implant sometimes and have that work. So People, had, I think there was a kind of a dip in ABI interest in the 2000s, and then that was sort of at the same time the interest in non-tumor ABI was starting to was starting to come up, and so people were looking at it less for NF2 and maybe more for some of these other reasons. But there's also been some more recent data with NF2, and I'll talk a little bit about that. There's been some centers who have really kind of gone back to using this uh, extensively in NF2 and getting some very good results. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So this is a, this is actually a diagram. Uh, this is uh, Bob Shannon, one of the audiologists at house many years ago, who's now retired. Uh, he, he made this figure and it, what it does is it kind of, it puts together uh, performance on simple sentences and quiet from zero to hundred percent with different types of devices. So on the left, we have a cohort of NF2 patients with ABIs, 183 patients with simple sentences and quiet, how they did on this performance scale from zero to 100. You'll see a lot of people down toward the bottom, maybe getting a little bit of sound perception, not a lot of benefit from closed or open set. And then you've got some patients doing better. We also, as I'll mention, another type of ABI was tried called the penetrating ABI, where we would put actually, along with the surface paddle, we would put a penetrating array into the cochlear nucleus. And while that showed some signs of improving selectivity of electrodes and also reducing charge um, um, electrical density and electrical power, it didn't really help performance. And so you'll see this is the AB penetrating group. Um, this is actually this green group here is a group of non-tumor ABIs that were done um, at a variety of centers. And you'll see that without a tumor, you know, if, there's a, if there's an ABI put in, you see that the, on average, the performance is quite a bit better if you're not worrying about a tumor. Then there, this was a more, this purple group here, this blue group was a more recent group from Los Angeles selected from, I think 2000, I wanna say it was 2008 and after. Um, these were patients where it was, it was tried to not, by, not cauterize the, um, not use extensive bipolar cautery around the eighth nerve or the, or the brainstem, but to minimize cautery around the uh, brainstem and around the eighth nerve root, um, root. So it was thought that perhaps some of the cautery from surgery was damaging the cochlear nucleus. And so that's one theory about how we may be able to make, get better performance. And so this is one group. This pink group is actually a group of non two or NF2 patients from Europe published by Professor Robert Baer and Cordula Matisse. And you can see the performance now is starting to become better with NF2 patients. As, as surgeons are trying to pay more attention to how they treat the tumor removal, how they treat the arteries in the area, how they treat the nerves. And, and so it's actually thought now it's better to cut the, auditor, cut the eighth nerve before cauterizing at all when you do a, a tumor resection. Because if you don't cut the eighth nerve first and you cauterize, then you'll get some excitotoxicity down into the cochlear nucleus and you may cause some damage. So this is now being more recognized as uh, something where you have to be very more gentle with the uh, cochlear nucleus and potentially cut the nerve before cauterizing. And then for comparison, this is a group of cochlear implant patients on AZ biosentences, which are actually harder, okay? But this is sort of where we expect cochlear implant patients to be now. So 
you can see your cochlear implant patients for the large part do extremely well with their cochlear implants. But now we're starting to see ABI performance become higher. So as we take more care to protect the cochlear nucleus and be gentle during the resection and do other things, there's some other theories about why we may get better results and we'll talk a little bit about them. But as we do that, we can get better results with, with, with implants or with the ABIs. This is a group um, at Huntington Medical Research Institute in Pasadena. Doug McCreary was, is a neuroscientist, neural engineer who was very, into, was very interested in ABIs and penetrating technologies in the, uh, the central nervous system and has done a tremendous amount of work in animal models over the years, kind of advancing penetrating technology and has, has been funded by the NIH for many, many years. Um, and he was one of the pioneers of the penetrating array on the ABI. So uh, about in the, in the early, 2000, uh, early 2000s, it was decided to try to use a penetrating array on the ABI to improve electrode selectivity and also reduce current levels and maybe improve speech recognition. So this is what the ABI or the penetrating array looked like. So there were 10 electrodes on a penetrating array and there were electrodes on the surface array as well. So they had to, you, you have to use less because you need a total of 20, you can't use more than 21 or 22, but it was decided to try to use this penetrating array to push that into the cochlear nucleus to get more selectivity on the, on the stimulation. And these electrodes were all, these are all insulated except for the tips. And then there were also, you could also etch the middle to get another stimulating site along the way. And actually I have to say that since this was developed, there's been a tremendous amount of advancement in penetrating technology. Now you can, you can design, they can design electrodes like this, but have several stimulating sites along the same electrode. So these are just single stimulation electrodes on each penetrating pin. But now you can put in, they've designed electrodes that are proven to, proven to be able to implant it over the long term, that you can stimulate multiple sites on the same electrode at different depths. So the, tech, the penetrating technology is getting better and better. And it may be at some point we want to revisit that because um, the results with um, penetrating ABIs really weren't better in terms of performance. There were some interesting things that were found, but it was not, it did not help performance. So non-tumor non -tumor patients are those, for example, who have, as I mentioned, meningitis, ossification of the cochlea, trauma, failed cochlear implant, sometimes from severe otosclerosis. Uh, those patients can really have, be problematic to put a cochlear implant in. And some of those patients, if they've had an, a cochlear implant that then failed or extruded, they, they aren't candidates for another cochlear implant. So you really only have an ABI as an option. So these are the kind of patients that we're talking about. This is a group, this was a meeting that Medal sponsored many years ago in Munich. I think it was 2000 and I think it was 2011 or 12 that this meeting happened. And there's a number of people in the ABI community here. This is Professor Baer, Bob Shannon. Uh, this is um, Ingeborg Hockmeyer from Medel is the CEO of Medel. Uh, Professor Coletti, Professor Matisse, uh, some surgeons from Japan, and Mark Schwartz and I from House were there. And we basically talked about how we can make the ABI performance better. What are the factors that, that we can modulate and change to improve performance? Because this was when we were starting to see some improvement in performance and people were interested in, in getting back into this. So some of the factors that are involved in potentially improving performance of the ABI are these here. So different issues with uh, tumor size, distortion of the brainstem, trauma, cautery and excitotoxicity is considered to be a very important factor. And so this is why we think about cutting the eighth nerve before we start cauterizing. Uh, venous drainage, we think a lot about that. Um, positioning, so the surgeons from Germany, for example, think that semi-sitting is better for these patients. So you don't have to cauterize as much. You can really limit cautery. Um, whether or not the positioning is really the factor or not is hard to know, uh, but they think that it plays a role. Um, and then growth factors and things like that. So I'm gonna talk a little bit, now we're gonna kind of switch over to pediatric indications. This is Professor Coletti. Uh, when we did some of our early work getting our study going in LA, uh, this is in, uh, in with Bob Shannon. Uh, this is Jean Moore, she's a neuroscientist who does a lot of work with, has done a lot of work with brainstem anatomy. So the patients we're talking about when we we're thinking about pediatric indications for the ABI are, uh, this is a normal, you know, this is your normal MRI of the intralonotary canal, parasagittal view showing all the nerves. 
Here's an example of cochlear nerve deficiency where you just have one nerve in the IEC. It may be the facial nerve or it may be a, another branch, maybe a, a branch of the facial nerve or the nervous intermedius, but it, you're not looking at an eighth nerve here. You're looking at probably the facial. And so there has been some work done in the early 2000s looking at how patients do with different inner ear malformations, particularly a pediatric population. And what we see is that patients with things like Mondini malformation in large vestibular aqueduct are these ones in red. They do extremely well, even though they have a malformation. EVA does very well with cochlear implantation. And then we see different groups that do quite a bit worse with CIs, such as cochlear nerve deficiency, which is sort of the darker blue, common cavity, which is sort of this lighter blue, um, cystic cochlear vestibular anomaly. So the patients that have problems with the cochlear nerve um, don't do as well, obviously, with a cochlear implant. They may have a small cochlear nerve. They may have an absent cochlear nerve. Okay, So these patients, over time, they usually plateau out or they don't get really any benefit with their cochlear implant. So what we, what we saw is, and we started looking at patients, pediatric patients who had ABIs, we actually can plot that sort of on the similar curve to this. And what we found is that ABI patients, when implanted young, uh, have, an, have an increase in their performance kind of similar to a low level cochlear implant performer. So they may be better than, they kind of end up on this line right in here. They don't end up as good as the, as the patients with no malformation, but they end up in this sort of mid range. This is sort of a stacked performance scale based on simple tests on the, on the low end of the axis and then more complex, difficult tasks as you go higher. So it's sort of um, from very basic performance to very, very complex pattern reception and pattern recognition. So based on this, we felt that, you know, we, as following some ABIs that had been implanted very early in children, we felt that there was, there was a rationale for, um, for ABI in children who fail cochlear implants because we can improve their performance over, an, over a CI. This is a study by Professor Coletti. I helped them uh, work on this study where they looked at patients with cochlear implants who failed cochlear implantation due to cochlear nerve deficiency, and then they were re-implanted with an ABI. And what they found was, so the patients, uh, this is using the categories of auditory performance scale from zero to seven, which is basically zero is no, no, no improvement, and then seven is open set speech perception and the scale kind of goes up, it's language independent. Um, it's been criticized as a scale, but it's one of the only things we can really use uh, with pediatric patients beyond between different languages. So uh, it persists in the literature because it's kind of one thing that we can try to use to compare patients. But as you can see, patients that failed cochlear implant with cochlear nerve deficiency are down in the white here. And then the group that was implanted with ABI is in this shaded shaded uh, circles here. And this is with and without disabilities. So some of these patients had, you know, developmental disabilities or other malformations, other, other syndromes. And those patients, as you can see, don't do as well as children without malformation or without disabilities. And that makes sense. Um, but you can see here that what this basically showed was that in patients that fail cochlear implant, with cochlear nerve deficiency, you can salvage them with an ABI. So assuming you get them early implanted with the CI and then you find out within a year or two that that patient is not progressing with the CI, you then can, you can salvage that patient by doing an ABI on them, okay? The other thing that was interesting that Professor Coletti found was when, when people looked at MRIs, when they thought they were seeing a cochlear nerve on the MRI, um, that was almost never a cochlear nerve. It was actually almost always the nervous intermedius, which is a branch of the facial nerve. And that's been, that's been found in a couple different studies where when people go in to do an ABI on a child who had a CI and failed it, and they thought there was an eighth nerve, what they found was they found the, the facial nerve and the nervous intermedius next to each other, but there was no eighth nerve. And the way you know that is that the facial nerve and the nervous intermedius are on the same side of the of the ICA artery at the brainstem, the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, and the eighth nerve will be on the other side from the facial nerve from the ICA. So in these cases, they always found the nerves on the same side and they all determined that those were the nervous intermedius. So it's interesting that when patients don't have an eighth nerve, they may have more than one nerve in there, but that other nerve is, may not be the eighth nerve. So our recommendation in children with cochlear nerve deficiency is that you implant them with a cochlear implant very early, assuming you have a cochlear, a cochlea present. And then if they fail, then you can proceed to ABI. Now there's been, um, there's been some interest in, um, in skipping that step 
in going straight to ABI in children. But the problem with that is that you don't know for sure whether the child's going to do well with a CI or not. Okay, the, the, the cochlear implant, or sorry, the MRI imaging is not perfect, and neither is uh, promontory stimulation. So you can try to do promontory, promontory stimulation evoked responses. You can use your MRI to try and determine it. But the reality is there was a study by Catherine Berman from Sydney that showed that even patients that only have one nerve in their internal auditory canal on an MRI can still get at least closed set performance with a cochlear implant on, on some times. So her article really suggested that you really should do CIs on every child that has a cochlear implant that you that where the family wants it. If they don't have a nerve, you do a cochlear implant assuming they have a normal cochlea, okay? If they fail the cochlear implant after a year to 18 months to two years and you have to give them a little longer because they take a little longer to progress. If they fail that after that period, and you're really concerned that they've failed, then you can potentially move on to ABI if the family wants to move on to ABI. Um, some people like Professor Sonarlu in Turkey have advocated simultaneous cochlear implant and ABI, one on each side, and he's published on that. In fact, a couple of those patients were patients that I referred to him. Um, and that can be done, but it's certainly not mainstream at this point. It's certainly not it's not the norm to do a simultaneous CI on one side and ABI on the other. Um, as we get more data from his patients over time, we may learn more about that. The interesting thing is that in some of those patients that were implanted with either with one of each, they found that they actually did see that the cochlear implant started to do maybe even better than the ABI. So here, here starts to become the question is, well, was it, should you really have done the ABI in that patient? Well, certainly you, should, you shouldn't have if they got a complication. And fortunately, those who are good at doing this usually don't get complications, but there are a number of possible complications to this surgery, including cerebral spinal fluid leakage, facial nerve weakness, uh, brainstem injury, stroke, um, you know, hemorrhage. Uh, there's, there's a number of potential complications, but fortunately in experienced hands, this is a safe procedure most of the time but you don't want to, you don't want to uh, subject a child to undue risk either. So at this point, I favor, personally, I favor a staged approach to these patients because if they, if they start progressing with their cochlear implant, then you don't need to move on to ABI. Um, and it's impossible to know right now based on imaging and electrophysiology who has an auditory nerve and who does not. It is still, it is still not able to be determined preoperatively who has enough neural tissue to get a cochlear implant performance that it works and not. Okay, so until we get to the point where we have better data and promontory stimulation is not, is not definitive, it's not definitive uh, because these patients have limited amount of neural tissue and they probably need sustained stimulation with a cochlear implant over time to determine whether the brain will get information from that. A one-time prom stim will not give you the answer, unfortunately. So it's, we're, we're, in an in, we're in an inexact science here and we're not able to definitively determine this. So what's been done now is we're starting to do studies of children with, with, with cochlear deficiency with ABIs. And for the most part, we are using, uh, we're, we're almost always using cochlear implants first, assuming the patient has a cochlea. Now, if they don't have cochleas, then you can go straight to ABI. Okay, assuming the family is, is committed and the patient really doesn't have associated problems. Uh, so in LA, we ran a study from 2013 through about 2017 or 18, uh, originally designed to enroll 10 patients um, that failed CI or that had cochlear aplasia and went, went straight, to, straight to ABI to determine safety of the procedure and also to determine uh, efficacy as well, limited efficacy. Okay, so this was done from Starting in 2013, we were funded by the National Institutes of Health, um, and we got also had to do the get approval through the FDA of the United States to do the study with what's called an IDE. So when you study a device that's not approved for a certain indication, you have to go to the FDA and say, we're going to do this study, this is our protocol, and they have to review it, it goes back and forth. You have your own institutional review board also has to review it. So it's a lengthy process, but it's not it's not insurmountable. It did take quite a bit of time to do. And then we actually applied to the NIH to get a grant for the clinical trial and we got funded, which we were very happy about because our review board at our hospital said, you cannot charge people for this. You have to be able to provide the surgery to anyone who's a candidate 
if they want to do it. And so we had to get a grant. We could not use health insurance or anything to do it. So we got a grant to do it. And fortunately, that was that was uh, we got that grant in order to be able to pay for the surgeries and everything. So and the and the study personnel, which was great. So our primary outcome measure for this study was safety of the device um, as determined by adverse events. And the secondary endpoint was access to sound as measured by a variety of different tests. And we also were doing some different speech perception tests down the road. Now, when you do an FDA study, you wanna make the outcome measures very simple. And then if you wanna study other stuff along the way, you can do that too. But the stuff for the FDA has to be very simple. Like, did you have a complication? What was it? How many are you gonna have? How many are you gonna allow before you stop doing this? You know, those kind of things. And then outcome measures, can they hear sound? What's their maze scale, which is a kind of an infant toddler parent reported scale? What can they do in the booth in terms of what can they hear sounds when presented in a booth situation? And it's kind of that you kind of have to stop very simple for that. And then you also, of course, have your research arm of your study where you do a whole bunch more complex testing to try to get more information, especially as the kids get older, about how they're doing. So that's kind of how we staged it. There was kind of the safety end of it. At, you know, access to sound. And then we did a whole bunch of other stuff just that was the research arm of the study to determine how well they were doing with the study. So these are, these were the inclusion criteria, cochlear nerve aplasia um, or cochlear nerve deficiency with poor CI performance. And we pretty much insisted that any child with a cochlea had to have a CI first because that's really the best way to determine whether they're gonna need an ABI. Uh, cochlear aplasia, we did have one patient with true Michelle aplasia that needed, that, that could not have a CI. And he was actually featured on CNN uh, on a report with Sanjay Gupta, who's the neurosurgeon who works for CNN and kind of their health guy. Um, very neat family, uh, family from the military that was in the Mil Navy of the United States and uh, just a really neat family, really cute kid, uh, no cochleas. So we went straight to ABI for him. And then of course, ossification of the cochlea, which fortunately now is pretty rare. Um, we don't see a lot of pneumococcal ossification because of vaccination, at least in the US. Uh, it may be a worldwide problem to some degree still, but we didn't have any patients that had ossification uh, in our study. And we included that because of the possibility of seeing it, but we didn't see anyone with that. So the other thing was that we had to see a lack of progress of auditory development, either with hearing aids or a CI, and the family had to have good expectations and they also had to be able to communicate with their child, which meant they had to do, be able to use sign language because the primary mode of these children for communication is always gonna be visual. Um, they may get additional information from their ABI, but the family has to use sign language with the child because they have to be able to communicate. So we always have a very detailed conversation with the family and tell them that you have to be signing because your child's primary mode of communication will likely be visual. Any auditory information that you gain will be, will be extra and will be helpful, but it's not gonna be the primary mode. And a lot of families, that's, that's a very difficult conversation to have with families because families are thinking that this device is gonna be the magical thing that's gonna let their child hear. And it's not, that's not what it does. It gives them access to sound. And in certain situations, it also allows them to have even limited open set speech understanding, which is great, but that doesn't mean they don't need visual communication, which they do. So we insisted that that happen. Exclusion criteria, we did not allow cognitive delays or developmental delays and any other significant medical problems because these children need to be healthy children. Um, and, and unfortunately, if you exclude cognitive or other developmental delays, you do exclude a number of children who probably would be candidates for ABIs. So thinking specifically about syndromes, probably the most common syndrome that's associated with cochlear nerve deficiency is CHARGE syndrome, okay? So CHARGE syndrome has a number of different malformations, including inner ear from malformations that include cochlear nerve deficiency. And we would not allow CHARGE in our study. Now, there have been surgeons that have done that implanted charge patients. I mean, Professor Coletti has implanted them. Some, Professor Sonarlu has implanted them. There are surgeons in the US that have implanted them. Um, one of the surgeons in the US had a couple of complications related to charge syndrome. And, and we decided that simply in this, at this stage of safety studies, we could not rationalize having children with other medical comorbidities in our study. It's just not something we could 
we could allow. And I still think now when I get calls from surgeons asking about, you know, I've got a child, they might need an ABI, you know, they say, well, they've got a syndrome and it's just, it's a hard conversation because in those situations, you're subjecting a child with a significant other medical risk to a craniotomy, which is not a benign procedure. So, you know, these children really need to be healthy. And if they've had any other tumors, brainstem tumors, things like that, um, they can't do it. We turned down one child because he had had um, a history of portal vein thrombosis in his liver and he's some sort of hypercoagulability syndrome. And his surgeon told us, no, I think he's okay. It's, it's, it's over. It happened a while ago. Um, he was on a anticoagulant for a while, but now he's fine. And we were just, we just said, no, I mean, if we have a patient who's hypercoagulable, and you get a thrombosis, you know, cerebral venous thrombosis, that's, that's a deadly complication. So we cannot allow that. So we were pretty strict about it. I know other people have done charge and other things, but the problem is, doc, as Professor Cletty showed, is that children with associated developmental disabilities don't do nearly as well with their, with their ABIs as, 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 as children without developmental problems. And I think it's different than CI because in CI, there's pretty good data CI being such a safe procedure that in children with developmental disabilities, there is, there is, a, there is published literature suggesting that there is benefit for those children in, in cognitive benefit and things in terms of getting their hearing better with a CI. In an ABI, I think the benefit versus risk is simply not there. I think it's simply not there. So uh, as we talked about, and we'll show a quick video on this, but um, we, we do a retrosigmoid approach in children because we're, we're, we're going behind the labyrinth. Uh, we place the, the device in the lateral recess of the fourth ventricle. We monitor facial nerve and lower cranial nerves. We do intraoperative evoked response monitoring to establish position of the device, make sure we're getting responses. And in our study, we use lumbar draining for two days. Some other, study, other st centers did not use lumbar drains, but we use them because we don't like pressure dressings over our devices. And it, I think that the critical healing period is the first 48 hours. If you get the child through 48 hours without getting spinal fluid under their flap, under the sc scalp flap, they're gonna be fine. If they, get, if they get CSF under their flap within the first two days, it's really hard to manage that. So we felt that it was better to put a lumbar drain in to get that, lower the pressure, to allow that wound to heal very well. And then you just simply clamp the drain and remove it. And at, at our hospital in LA, Children's Hospital, they manage lumbar drains on the floor. So these patients did not need to stay in the ICU. So that was, that was very helpful. And every, we fortunately did not have any complications related to lumbar drainage. This is, uh, we'll show a little bit of, this is, this is basically anatomy here, facial nerve, lower cranial nerves. This is the um, anterior inferior cere cerebellar artery. You can see there's no eighth nerve here. This is a lateral recess. This is the implant paddle being placed in. We did sedated activation at four to six weeks to, monitor, to map all the electrodes to make sure there were no side effects, either cardiac or pulmonary. And we, have, we, we actually did ours in the operating room, but other places do it at, like in the recovery room or a procedure room or something with an anesthesia present. Um, and in adults, you know, in adult ABI patients, we used to monitor them when, when they were activated to make sure they didn't have a cardiac effect and we had a crash card available and we never had no one's ever had an episode in an adult where they had a cardiac event when, when they were activated with their ABI. It was always a fear, but it never happened. So we don't routinely monitor adult patients being activated now with, with, with cardiac monitoring, but children we still do because they're small and, and we wanna make sure that you know, they have less reserve and we don't wanna make sure there's any problems. But realistically, we've not seen any. We did see a couple of electrodes that um, caused a little bit of a um, a myogenic response. So we deactivated those, but then we were able to add them in later. So usually you'll see like a, like a, like a 11th nerve kind of shoulder response. You may see that. Some, the other thing you sometimes see when you activate the patient behaviorally is you'll see a little bit of a, of a little bit of a wobble. They'll have a little bit of a sway, like a vestibular effect. And you can shut that electrode off and then you can activate it again later. You can add it in later. Cause what happens is the brain just starts adapting to the stimulation and you can usually add in those electrodes that you deactivated. So this is, fortunately we didn't have, we had one sp spinal fluid leak at the beginning of our series. And then we started using lumbar drains and that fixed the problem and that's controversial, but that's what we did. And fortunately we really didn't have any other significant complications. We had a patient that needed a blood transfusion, but that's because the, 
we didn't lose a lot of blood. It was just that their hematocrit dropped below the hospital level criteria for transfusion. We kind of didn't want to, but we, we were forced to do that. And we really didn't have any other significant complications. Um, vestibular effects, uh, we had a patient have to stay in the hospital another day because of vomiting, but not a big deal. This is what we do. This is sort of a diagram of the responses with the ABI in the booth. So you can see the, the aided the responses. This is similar to a cochlear implant mapping um, response where you, you plot the response level at the different frequencies with tone bursts. And then this numbers include the sound detection thresholds as well as the maze scores, which are the family reported scores. And then on the bottom, these are the electrodes that are active. Um, people are now developing a paddle array kind of paddlegram that shows you know, the active electrodes, deactivated ones, ones that have side effects. But for the most part in these patients, we're not getting side effects on the electrodes anymore. They're either active electrodes that are providing benefit or they're just off. And you'll see that in many of these patients, you get about two thirds of the array because of the way, the, in the way that it's sitting in the nucleus and about one third of the array usually don't get a good response on. So you can make an argument for children, maybe we need a smaller paddle, maybe we need a smaller paddle for everybody. But, um, and MedL's paddle is a little smaller than Cochlear's is. So MedL ABIs have a smaller paddle uh, with smaller electro with fewer electrodes, only 12. So, you know, there's, there's less um, a surface area to think about there. So just show you just a couple of uh, pictures here and a couple of videos. So this is uh, three of our patients that were in our study. Um, really amazing people. Um, you know, I got to think if I, with my children, if I, would I put my child in the hands of somebody to have them do a craniotomy as an experimental trial? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if I would, but these families were, were, were so committed. Um, and two of these patients are from Texas. Uh, one is from Canada. We did, we had six patients total that we implanted. Uh, this girl here, this third girl from the left is our rock star. She's, she's getting open set speech per perception. She can read. She does not, her, vo her, her verbalizing is not super intelligible, but she's getting better all the time. And these patients, the progress takes a long time. It's not a short process. It takes a long time. So we're talking years. You know, you get, you get aided responses and then two years later, three years later, you start seeing wow, now you see them getting beyond pattern recognition. Now you're seeing open closed set performance. And in, in a probably about one in four to five children, you may get some open set, okay? I think that, you know, the question right now is how many children do you need to implant to get a child who can understand open set speech? And in, in adult patients, the number is around one in five. So about 20% of adult ABI patients will understand open set. Any, set, any amount of open set, meaning random speech. Whereas four out of the five will only understand closed set. So you can give them a list of words, you read them and they can pick the word, but they can't understand a randomly spoken word. Whereas one in five can. And I think it's about the same in children. It may be, it may be two in five, but I think it's about the same. It's about 20%, maybe 25% of children given enough time and, and progress will be able to understand open set. This is a, a video can you hear this? Can you guys hear? Yeah, we can hear. You can go okay. a little louder. On the audio? Yeah. I don't know if I can turn it up, but... Um, so this is... I'm, you guys have seen this. I'm going to move it, move ahead a little bit here to show. This is a craniotomy. So this is an, a right ear and a child. You have to let it run here. So you see, this is a retrosigmoid craniotomy in a, in, a, in a right ear. Giving a little delay here. And I'll move forward a little bit so you can see. So this is when we're finding the lower cranial nerves. So now this, th in this case, it's interesting because this is the facial nerve and there's another nerve next to it, but the ICA, you can see the ICA branch. So this is probably nervous intermedius, okay? So they're on the same side of the ICA. And then lower cranial nerves are farther down, which is gonna follow down here. This is lower cranial nerves. 
This is ninth nerve down here. So here's the lateral recess here. You can start seeing the CSF coming out. And you can see the other thing we usually do is we usually cut off the, the ABI paddle has two sort of pieces of Dacron mesh on each side. And in children, we almost always cut them off. In adults, sometimes you'll trim them and leave them there to, because the lateral recess is larger. But in, AB, in kids, you'll usually trim off those side, what we call the fins of the, uh, of the paddle. You see, they've been cut off here. And the array is placed so that the electrodes can make contact with the brainstem surface. This is the same procedure in adults or, or the children. in position, we prepare for intraoperative testing, which we expect to show a strong early response. So basically what that shows is you put the implant in and then you get, you do your, you basically test between pairs of electrodes. So in that case, they chose 16 and 10, which is near the center of the array. And you get a, you get that early peak of the evoked response. You want to see that second knee of the response. Sometimes you get multiphasic. You'll get like a two or three, like three, three peaks. Um, and then you test each corner. What you usually do is we test the center of the array and then each of the corners. And then we, if we decide, if we get good responses, we don't move it. If you don't get good responses, we'll adjust based on which corners we're getting responses on. We may pull it out a little bit or put it in a little bit more, or shift it, rotate a little bit based on which responses are being, being received. I think initially when ABIs were put in, we tended to put them in a little deep. And what we found is it's better to tolerate that last row of three being out of the lateral recess, particularly in children, uh, in adults as well. Because I think initially the cochlear paddle is kind of big. The Medel paddle, is more appropriately sized to be sort of in the recess completely. And the metal, metal device is not approved in the US. It's approved CE marked and everything. So you can get it in the rest of the world, but it's not approved in the US. This is a, a response from, this is one of, this is a girl I was showing you, our, our, our excellent performer. She's just doing some basic testing, audiological testing with, you know, activating, turning on certain electrodes. So that's just to basic, some basic testing. They're running, running the electrode array, make sure everything's you know, going well. Yeah. So this is her, what she's, what you're, they're training her to do is when she hears a sound, she's supposed to do like drop the block or you know, like a play audiometry sort of task. And then they gave her they gave her a sound at that point, and then she acknowledged that she heard the sound. So this is this is sort of you know the best thing you can see here is that the patient is signing. So she has she has ability in sign language. She's communicating, and now she's getting extra information from the ABI, which is great. That's exactly what we want. We want the patient to be fully signing, engaged in communication, and now getting extra environment you know environmental sounds. And in her case, she's actually able to to read. Um, her vocalization is not great, which is very typical of these patients, um, but she's able to do, she's doing quite well. This is, I'll, I'll, I, won't, I won't show this. This is a video uh, from CNN. I'll just kind of go, there's a, it was a little thing they did on one of our patients. I'm not sure why I have blue on here, but 
this this was a patient, one of our patients that we did. You can see. So here's this is a child. He, he this is a child who did not have cochlea's. So he was um, implanted at age five. It would have been nice to implant him younger, but the family found out about the study. We were actually, I think, in year two or three of the study. The family found out about the study and they contacted us. And he just met our age criteria, um, and he had no cochlea, so we went straight to ABI. And uh, cute kid, really great kid, uh, great family. Family, he's a complete signer. You know, family from the very beginning, they signed, they learned sign with him at a very young age. So he's already got communication. Now he's just getting additional auditory information, which is great, you know, in the long term, well, we want to see what he's doing at age 18, for example, you know, from five, five to 18, we want to see that, uh, that increase and in how he's doing. Um, so, you know, as you can imagine, these kind of studies require big teams with a lot of expertise. And in LA, we ran uh, the study with House Clinic and Huntington Medical Research Institute, Children's Hospital LA, we had two neurosurgeons, one was a pediatric neurosurgeon, one is Mark Schwartz. Uh, we had uh, our intraoperative audiologist, we had our pediatric team, uh, we had, you know, clinical specialists, we had, you know, compliance people, just, it's a, it's a big, it's a big task to do a study like this. And fortunately, we had great people and, and it was, it was just a really great study. And we, you know, I got to say, of all the things I've done in my career, uh, getting, doing this study and having it done safely and getting those patients through and demonstrating safety, that's that's one of my biggest accomplishments in my career. I'm so happy that we're able to do that and demonstrate that. Um, and now, now what we're in the era we're in now is sort of deciding um, what's next. So what we have in the U.S. is we have a couple centers doing ABIs in children that are sort of doing them still under compassionate use circumstances. There's no FDA approval. There are world centers doing them, like Professor Sonarlu in Turkey is doing. He does a huge volume. Uh, we have surgeons in Germany, you know, the U.S., others, but I think for children particularly, the future is what are, how are we going to approach this? Is it just going to be one of those things where every once in a while we do one? Are we going to try to get an approval? We've engaged the companies and the companies are not particularly interested in pushing for approval for children for these devices. I think because ABI is just not a part, big part of their business and it would require a fair amount of financial resources and a commitment from their side from a legal standpoint and and I think they're just not particularly interested in that. And so the difficulty in the US is I'm not sure we'll ever get to a, an approval. So what that means is if children need the device, we have to apply through our local review boards for a compassionate use approval for the device. And that's something you can get. You can get uh, the FDA to give you a compassionate use approval. So if you have a child who's appropriate and everything lines up and you have your team, you know, you have your team that can do this, then you can apply for a compassionate use approval for that child. And, and then put the device in. Now, the problem is you need, this is not something you just do as a one-off. You need to have all your personnel in place and people you've worked with. So for example, in LA, I know there's people that can do this. Uh, where I'm at now, there's not people that can do this. So it's something that we would, you know, you really have to have the, the environment and the skill and the expertise around you. Um, and I think from the, on the adult side, I think what we're seeing is, we are seeing, there was a period of time too with NF2, and that's probably a separate lecture, but with NF2, there was a big interest in using medications for NF2, like Avastin and other medicines to shrink tumors. And I think what people have found is that Avastin works well for a while while people are taking the medication, but then when you stop the medication, the tumors grow again. And we thought, oh, for a while we thought, oh, maybe we won't do, be doing as much surgery on these patients. But it, it turns out that it may just delay the surgery somewhat, but these patients still need surgery at some point for big tumors. Many of them are still gonna lose their hearing and are not cochlear implant candidates. Um, they have no auditory nerve and they still need ABI. So on the adult side, what we're trying to figure out is how to do, how to do the devices more carefully to get better performance. And um, also looking at non-tumor indications, when would be another you know, reason to do it? There's some interest in also using ABIs for tinnitus. So we did a we did a study uh, not too long ago looking at some of our NF2 patients with ABIs and doing tinnitus scoring scales and questionnaires and we did find that ABIs do suppress tinnitus and there's been some interest worldwide in looking at maybe ABIs for tinnitus but again that's a big that's a big procedure for tinnitus uh, but um, there may be a way to 
place an ABI where, or, or a type of ABI where you don't disturb the hearing. Like for example, you may use some sort of smaller electrode or array, place it near the cochlear nucleus, not affect hearing because you haven't affected the eighth nerve, but you've, you've modulated the tinnitus. So there may be a role for that. We know cochlear implants suppress tinnitus when they're active in patients with tinnitus and hearing loss. We know that they suppress tinnitus when they're active. So there's some interest in tinnitus management with ABI. And then I guess for the other thing for the long term is that there's renewed interest in going back to these penetrating arrays again, because the penetrating technology has really, really advanced since we since the PABI was done in the early 2000s. Now we've got multi-shank electrodes. Uh, we've done they've done a lot more long-term animal studies looking at long-term implantation. So there's probably a, a period, you know, a time to go, some, some period where we may go back and say, let's try penetrating arrays again and see if we can improve things that way, particularly if we do some exercise, some of these careful principles of careful dissection, avoiding cautery near the, near the brainstem, avoiding cautery of the nerve, things like that, and get these patients to do, to do a little bit better than they're doing. So um, probably, probably two or three lectures in one here, but um, Hopefully that's made a little bit of sense to you and kind of showing you what the lay of the land is for ABIs. I think um, going forward, our challenge is to um, really figure out the best use of them, particularly in children and what the best patients are to, to implant and in adults figure out how we can improve performance. Um, and um, other people are looking at things like um, um, optical stimulation, they're looking at, at mass ionier, they're looking at optogenetics, things like that. I will make, I'm going to make a little bit of a, a, uh, um, of an ad here. I will say this, this is, can you see this? Yeah. So basically, um, Dr. Schwartz and I just published a textbook on ABIs. So if you're interested in learning more about ABIs, um, there's a textbook published by Tima uh, called Auditory Brainstem Implants. And it has basically, it's about 20 chapters. It's a pretty small textbook, but it summarizes the entire field from implantation to activation, to theory, to everything. So if you, if you or anyone you know knew were interested in developing an ABI program, this would be your manual. Uh, to look at that and, and determine and give that to your team and study it and, and go that route. So a little bit of a little bit of an ad here at the end of the talk <laughs> for the for this book. I don't have a PDF copy that I can email at this point, but uh, I'm sure before long somebody will get one. But uh, I don't have one right now to send out to you. But uh, if you're interested in ABIs, um, just something to something to think about. It's we spend a lot of time working on this book and. I, what I learned from publishing a, editing, editing a textbook is that it's a one-time deal. I never want to do it again. <laughs> Trying to get people to write chapters for a textbook and get them in on time is, is not an enjoyable task. So if you do it, if you edit a textbook, do it one time. Don't do it ever again. <laughs> That's my recommendation on that. Well, Eric, listen, um, you know, it was definitely a absolutely mind provoking lecture because you're you're like you're like a frontierman you're you're kind of like you know exploring the the west when everybody was living on the east coast in the 17 and 1800s you're, you're a pioneer by all means in this in this whole new uh uh treatment for patients who have you know either lack of cochlear or, or auditory nerve and i mean it just it was very inspiring to just listen to you because your energy, your 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 whole perspective is, by all means, you know, much different from from every from ninety nine percent of the rest of the world. So I want to really thank you for sharing, you know, your 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 groundbreaking experience with us. Um, does anybody have any questions? I'm just going to make one comment to you on that, Richard. One of the, one of the things that I really learned about running clinical trials mm -hmm. is that we as physicians we are the patient's protector. We are, we are, you know, people, people look into different treatments all the time. They may come to you and say, you know, oh, I'm thinking about having this done, this done. We're, we're there, we're the, we're the, we're the people that are supposed to protect the patient. So we're also supposed to research and improve and figure out new ways of doing things. But what I have learned through this study is the value of counseling patients extensively, appropriate expectations, 
being very cautious with how you do things. Also, just being slow to adopt. I mean, you know, the companies are always putting out new electrodes, this and that, do this, this device, this device. And I've kind of, I've kind of t always taken kind of a slow approach on that. I've always kind of been like a slow adopter when the, when the company says, oh, we changed this on this device for you, use this now. And I've always kind of been kind of slow to do that. And I think that there's value in sort of taking, you know, a very careful approach to things, being very protective of your patient and, um, and just being, you know, considering yourself as the doctor to be there, you're the person, you're, you're first do no harm. You know, it's a Hippocratic oath, first do no harm. And, and then once persons, people have made an appropriate, you know, looking into something appropriate and you think it's appropriate, yes, you can, you can, you can recommend it to them and counsel them on it, but first do no harm. Yeah, well, thank you. I mean, I, I'm fully aware of what you're saying. Um, anybody else have any comments today, questions? Well, this, we're going to post this on the uh, YouTube channel for uh, Global ENT. So uh, anybody who didn't watch it will have the opportunity to do it. I know Misha from London uh, just had a bait. He and his partner just had a baby yesterday or this morning, so they couldn't join us. So um, I will say too, you know, I'm happy to, I'm not doing, I'm not currently doing ABIs in my current practice. I think long-term I'd like to do adults here, but, but um, if anyone has like a patient at any point where they want to you know, ask me whether what they think about their MRI or what to do. I'm happy to review stuff because I, I do that for free. I don't, I don't charge for that. I mean, if I get, I get emails from people and they're saying, Hey, I've got this patient. Um, I'm not sure what to do. What do you think? And I'm always happy to talk to people about that. And, and also, I'm also happy to make referrals, you know, for, for people, for, for appropriate centers to have things done. Um, if they're if they're wondering, you know, I don't know where to send this patient. I've got somebody who needs this, and I don't know where to send them. Um, I'm happy to talk to you about it and and give you my thoughts on it. I'm I'm pretty. I think you've kind of seen from my talk. I'm pretty careful. I'm pretty. I don't I don't like subjecting patients to undue risk. So there are people that are pretty darn good at this stuff. And if you're wondering, you know, where to send somebody or whether somebody's a candidate, I'm happy to chat with you or email you or or have a phone call with you at some point. I will post, uh, I'll post your contact information, Eric, on our uh, WhatsApp platform so people will know how to get in touch with you. Yeah, I'm happy to talk to anybody. Okay. Giovanni has a question, I think. Uh, uh, Richard, uh, okay. Uh, Eric, uh, congrats. For, this is a very great talk. Uh, I would like to make just a comment and a question. The comment is, uh, I think it's very easy in the scientific community to criticize the ABI, but you know that in the NF2 drama, ABI is always better than nothing. Mm -hmm. And so we have to consider this aspect of surgery. Uh, for sure, this is the roadmap to improve the technology, to improve uh, uh, the chances to have better devices by the time. And uh, for sure, it's not a solution, but uh, I think that we have to keep going on uh, the research on ABI, and maybe the next step uh, could be uh, the um, implants in the brain auditory area. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And maybe this could be the future. The question is, um, there is in literature a very uh, optimistic uh, point of view about the, uh, putting cochlear implants after uh, acoustic neuroma surgery. I'm talking about not in NF2, but in sporadic mm -hmm. acoustic. Sometimes you have some very critical cases with a far advanced atherosclerosis on one side and an acoustic on the other side. But to me, the uh, results of the cochlear implant in uh, sporadic acoustic, always you have to preserve the cochlear nerve, are a little bit too much optimistic. Agreed. My experience is not so good. I put some cochlear implants after acoustic neuroma surgery, and after six months, the device doesn't work. And that's why I think that the results in literature are a little bit uh, skeptic. I agree. I totally agree with you, Giovanni. Not only on that, not only in the fact that the CI after acoustic results are poor, but it's kind of the same. It's kind of the same argument people made 
with putting CIs in NF2 with either radiated tumors or small tumors with poor hearing, because they said, oh, well, we'll just put a cochlear implant in. We don't need to do surgery or take, you know, take the tumor out or put ABI. We'll just do a CI. And very similar situation where the results are generally pretty poor unless the tumor is very small, you know, less than a centimeter, less than 1.5 centimeter, not growing. The results are pretty poor, but it was kind of a similar, it was kind of a similar thing because for a while people were saying, oh, we don't need ABI. We'll just use CI for these NF2 people with these smaller tumor with bad hearing. We just put a CI in and then the tumor is growing and they don't get good performance or they, they lose a performance. Same thing as you, when you take the tumor out, you try to preserve the eighth nerve, the, the cochlear nerve. The results, I, from what I've seen, have, the results have not been very good and not been very good. Very similar to what you're saying. Okay, thanks, thanks. So and the problem, see... the problem too, just one other comment on that. The problem with that too is that you can't really use ABR at the time of surgery to determine the eighth nerve viability because I think it was Mayo Clinic showed that, you know, they tried to do, if you have a preserve the cochlear nerve and then you do an ABR to see if you can try to stimulate through it at the time of the tumor removal, the ABR may not be there, but six weeks later, the ABR is there. So you can't use intraoperative ABR to really know for sure whether that nerve can support it. So you're kind yeah. of, you're kind of doing it blindly. You're kind of just having to do it, you know, if you want yeah, to do it. Sure. Sure. Thank you, Eric. Good to see you. Hope yeah. to see you soon. Yeah. We need Bye. to have, we need to have uh, I need to have a uh, Cacio e Pepe with you. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm severely, I severely in withdrawal from, from, from Italian, Northern Italian cuisine. Okay, Eric, you are welcome anytime. Better go. Bye. Bye. Cita alta. <laughs> Ciao, Ricci. Bye bye. Okay, thank you, everybody. Unless uh, Aziz from uh, Swaziland really appreciated the lecture, he sent a little uh, message on chat. Uh, let's just see if there's anybody other who has a chat to. Um, Anybody have any questions that they want to ask before we terminate this? Awesome lecture from Saeed, Dr. Rowe from uh, Paraguay. Terry wants to thank you from Paraguay as well. Roman from Ukraine. Terry. All right. Miss Terry. And Oscar from Ukraine. Everybody. Yeah, we need to, we have to be able to get together again. It's just, we're all in, so we love Zoom, but we just, we got to get together in a meeting. And it's just everyone, we just, the social aspect is just missing. You know, we just, uh, it's been so long. Yeah, here's Saeed from uh, Swaziland. Saeed, you can unmute yourself. Saeed. Hello. Yeah. Aziz. Yeah, Prof, thank you so much for such an amazing lecture and really appreciating and um, keep going. Um, something important in our place and our settings where we are very, very poor and listening for such a clinical trial process. It's something very amazing. Thank you so much. Well, just don't, don't ever, what, what I've learned from this too is don't, don't let people get you down. There's, when you, when you want to do something, when you want to push your, when you, want, when you want to push what you're offering to the next level, when you're ready to sort of move up, there will be detractors. There will people, there will be people that will try to pull you down. Okay. They will say, you can't do it. No, it's not possible. Don't let people do that. Because when people start to do that, you know that you're starting to do something that you probably should do. When people start trying to pull you down, don't let them pull you down. You know, you're, Thank when, you you're, so when your team, when your team is ready to go to the next step, prepare and move to the next step. Don't let people pull you down. Cause it's, that's one thing you see through this process is that people you know, people for a variety of reasons, they tend to be derogatory and, and they don't, they don't tend to, some people are very encouraging and other people kind of try to pull people down. Don't let people pull you down. Thank you. Prof. Move on, yeah, move, up, move on and offer yeah, more yeah. services, offer, you know, do what you need to do to get to offer the, what you need to do. Thank you. I appreciate okay. it. Listen, everybody. Thank you, Eric. Just one thing, Eric at Wilkinson uh, mad.com. Correct. Yep. That's my personal. That's fine. That's easy. That's always going to work. Okay, good. Um, just use that one. Okay, yeah. very good. Eric, listen, thank you for their inspirational talk, okay? We like your energy. We like your, your, your work, okay? So thank you again. 
Are you up in uh, Richard? Are you in uh, Washington? Yeah, yeah, I'm home. Nice, nice. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Appreciate it, and hope to see everybody in the near future once this virus goes away. Okie dokie. Thanks, Ed. Thank you, Eric. Thanks, everybody. Right. Bye bye now.